I'm just curious how you how you've uh, found it lately being um, nonpartisan. How, how has that been for you? Um, it's been uh, absolutely uh, amazing, to be honest with you, um, because uh, you know uh, the messaging is totally about my own. Uh, I can speak my own mind how I feel on the issues. I can speak for the people I represent. I'm not held back in any way by uh, any party, and um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a thousand percent better. It's a huge improvement to to the current party system, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, one thing that really piqued my interest, uh, you were having a back and forth with Con O'Brien, and yep. uh, you were talking with you, this was on Twitter, and you were talking with him about um, NALCOR, the Auditor General, these kind of things. And you have one line, you, you say, I've written the Premier and asked him to unleash the AG on NALCOR. And then you continue, you say, the problem is with all this stuff is that it has nothing to do with red or blue, all about the cocktail circuit. Yep. Can, can you tell me what you mean by that line? It's all about the cocktail circuit. Uh, I, guess, I, I guess it's my belief uh that uh you know that uh, under our current system um like the political parties or the two main political parties being the pcs and the liberals uh they rely uh quite heavily obviously on uh, donations and corporate donations and uh there's obviously uh influence that goes along with that and i think you know it's pretty i think it's pretty clear you can see that uh, even when one party, like like even when one of the mainstream parties uh, um, are, are sort of um, fading out of power and and losing favor with the public, uh, you'll see that it'll be harder for them to raise all those corporate donations. But they won't be cut off. Uh, you, you notice that the big businesses, if you look at it, they will contribute to both parties. But uh, depending on who's in power or who's felt is going to be in power, that's who will get the lion's share. Um, and uh, and so you know, I believe you know, that we have a small province, and uh, I guess there are a lot of uh, influential people, people in uh, you know in in, in authority, uh, who uh, as far as I'm concerned. Regardless if it goes red or blue, they're always going to have that influence. Well, I and, guess that's and, what I mean. and these to you, um, if if I could just kind of take it the step, these are people with economic power more so than than political power. Yes. Yes, that's that's my view. Okay, and I know that. I mean, we we have had uh, people. Uh, go and do the, you know, all the information on the political donations is out there. And you can see exactly what you say, that the year before the blue party gets in, all the money goes towards the blue, except for, you know, a couple thousand from all the same donors give to the reds as well. And then when it goes the other way, you can see, yep. you can see the money shipped right before yep. the, the parties change. And the, the poor old orange team always gets the exact same amount of money um from from their one friend and then lorraine michael is their biggest uh contributor otherwise you know so it's it, it's, yeah. it's kind of sad okay so i guess my question yeah and, is, by, and, by, and by the way john I, let me just add to that that i think that um while i believe that um that's a downfall to our system in terms of the the the, the corporate donations and the amount and and quite frankly uh I, I believe that we need some serious uh, reforms, and I would love to see reforms whereby the amount of money that can be contributed by any given company or entity or individual uh, to a party or to individual candidates would be slashed significantly to put people on a level playing field and to eliminate any uh, potential conflicts and any potential um influence that that, that 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 i guess could come to bear as a result of that uh but in the same by the same uh, token that i believe that exists with uh you know with uh, big business and so on and the corporate sector um i i, I also believe likewise that 
uh, you know, that uh, there are concerns there as it relates, you know, to the NDP as well and their close affiliation to uh, to unions and so on. So, uh, you know, I'm not I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that they have the same influence because obviously they don't. They've never been in power. But if we're going to make reforms around uh, raising money and contributions and how much contributions and uh, any given party or candidate can receive, then if it's going to apply to uh, corporations, it should also apply to unions equally. Oh, sure. And you know what? I, I'm certainly not going to be the one who's going to step up and defend um, <laughs> the yep. NDP or the Federation of Labor. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, that's that's exactly, I think, part of part of the problem in in the politics too. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I just want to make my commentary yep. fair and balanced and how I feel about it. Right. And I so will be. I can, so, I, so, I, so it would be unfair for me to attack those two parties and attack. The, the corporate influence and ignore the fact that we also have a similar type influence, obviously not to the same degree, one could or the same amounts of money, but we still have that influence as it relates to uh N D P you know, as it relates to unions as well, right? I will make that abundantly clear. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, and I and I I'm right there with you on that. Yeah. Okay, so I yeah. guess the the question then for me is um I got just a couple more follow-ups for you. What does that mean then about democracy in Newfoundland and Labrador? Because you hear people say, oh, so if you were to say a line like this, it's all about the cocktail circuit, people would then turn around and say, oh, well, it's a conspiracy that you're we a conspiracy theory that you're weaving, or, you know, we have a well-functioning democracy. What would you say to those people? Um, I believe Quite frankly, um, I don't believe we do have a well-functioning uh, democracy. Uh, I believe that uh, democracy ends in our system after you uh, place your uh, vote in the uh, ballot box. And then for the next four years, we quite frankly have a dictatorship. Uh, and, and, I, I'm, and when I say the word dictatorship, because I've been called to ask about that, oh, you're saying that we're like, uh, you know, we're like Nazi Germany or something. No, boy. I mean, like, like. Let's not go extreme with what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, uh, sure, there is democracy in terms of you get the vote, but after you get the vote, as Tom Marshall quite elegantly put it, at one point in time uh, when uh, asked about some, pilot, some le piece of legislation that went through the House Assembly and there was some controversy, or maybe it was the budget, I don't know, when Tom put it so eloquently when he said, oppositions have their say, government has their way. And that is so true. Uh, like once a government is elected, they hold total power to do whatever they want. And under our system, we don't have. Uh, well, under our system, we could have all-party committees, for example, uh, that could be utilized. Um, like we don't need to change legislation to make that happen. That already exists. But the problem is, is that when it comes to all-party committees for uh, legislation or other matters. It's basically at the call of the government or at the, or the, the, the majority of the House, which means ultimately the government would have to say, yeah, we're going to have an all-party committee to look at leg all this legislation or to look at this matter or that matter or something else. As you saw, there have been a couple of instances where they did form an all-party committee, I think, on mental health was one, yeah. and yeah. Uh, the shrimp quotas, I think, there was another, uh, you know, an another one. But we could have... I mean, as far as I'm concerned, legislation should have to go through an all-party committee um, um, process before it ever reaches the floor of the House of Assembly. We'd have much better legislation uh, than we have now because, quite frankly, what happens is that government crafts a piece of legislation. They put a, a, the opposition will get a briefing uh, probably the day before it's going to be created in the House. They'll get a half hour or whatever just to explain here's what you know, here's what's in it by some staff people. Um, and, and ironically, uh, the um, the government members get the same briefing themselves because uh, the, the, they'll say, you know, you, you, and you, uh, we need you to speak to this and defend this today. So you're going to a briefing tomorrow morning, and they're going to tell you what it's about so that you can have some speaking notes so you can support this. Whether you agree with it, N not do you agree with it, so you can support this. And the opposition will get their little briefing, and it goes to the House. And, of course, then when the opposition finds flaws or, you know, potentials to improve its amendments, of course, you bring it up. But I've hardly ever 
seen an amendment accepted or happen because that means that uh, as government we have to stand publicly and say, yeah, we never thought about that. So yeah. we'd rather put something through that's flawed than to give in or to suggest that we overlook something that the opposition didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so there are tremendous flaws, uh, uh, you know, with democracy. Once this 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 idea of absolute power to do whatever you want for four years, uh, no recall legislation, no way of getting rid of the government if they're doing or or an individual member if they're you know not performing um, properly. Um, so yeah, I mean there are all kinds of flaws towards. Um, okay, so just on, uh, on the question of democracy again, because I, I understand even even for myself, and I pay pretty close attention. A lot of the yeah. inner workings in the house are a little bit beyond me, and and I can understand why a lot of people sort of wouldn't wouldn't care a whole lot a whole lot about it. You know, uh, sometimes people would say too, they'd say, oh well, I cast my vote. The government is in there. They make difficult decisions. If stuff comes up, the media is going to tell me about it, and if I need to, I can get in touch with my MHA or, you know, we'll protest, or protests happen and you see the government changes things, and then people, sort of, they sort of go, so look, poof, uh, democracy works. What, what would you say in response to something like that? Well, uh, you know, um, we've seen all kinds of things protested over the years and uh, that haven't changed. Uh, we've seen, I, I mean... Look, if you want to talk about democracy, just think about this for a second. We had this budget that just came down, budget 2016, okay? Now, I was elected by the people of my district, just like 39 others, okay? Uh, I was part of the government side. I saw the budget two hours before it was read on the floor of the House of Assembly. You go into what's known as a budget lockup situation, the same as the media does, where a couple of hours beforehand, you go in... Uh, to the room. There's someone waiting for you at the door. They say, do you have a cell phone with you, Paul? I said, yeah. Hand over your cell phone. And uh, they take your cell phone on you so that you can't leak anything. And uh, if you need to go to the washroom, you basically have to raise your hand like you would in school. And <laughs> somebody actually escorts you to the washroom and stands outside the washroom door while you're in there and then walks you back into the room again so you can't leak anything. That's the first time you've seen the budget. That uh, you had no, you had zero input into the budget. The cabinet crafted the budget. Members were not even consulted. This time around, it was even a little different. Again, I was used to in the sense that, in addition to handing in the budget document, everyone was handed an envelope uh, with your district name on it. And when you opened the envelope, it was a list of the things they were shutting down in your district. So, someone for the first. So think about it now. Mm-hmm. I'm a member out in some area. I'm a duly elected by the people, I'm part of the government, and the decisions have been made that, oh, you're losing this clinic in this community, this one here, you're losing two schools, four libraries, an AES office, here you go, that's what you're losing. And that was the first time that member knew anything about it um, or was consulted on it was two hours before it was read in the House as a done deal. Wow. Now, you, now you tell me, is that democracy? Well, I mean, certainly not even in the even in the, the <laughs> even in the limited the limited sense of this representative system that we've got, you know. And I think that's yeah. that's part of the critique here is, of course, yeah, representative democracy itself is is a limited form. But then what we've got is we've got representative democracy with the lid on tight, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So, so if anybody told me about that, that would be my response, quite frankly. Is you tell me is that democracy? Do you? You tell me, do you believe, as someone who voted for me, as your representative, do you believe that your views are represented at the table? Yeah. yeah. And the answer, quite frankly, would have to be no. And, you know, I I, I just I just want to go back to this thing about uh, the cocktail circuit one more time again. And just uh-huh. to just to, to get you to clarify where they fit where does where does this thing that you know we might call the cocktail circuit and i think this has got to be the title of what i'm writing where do they fit in in our democracy well look uh the bottom line is is that uh the 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 core our corporate sector okay we rely heavily on the corporate sector for you know for the economy for 
uh, you know, creating uh, job opportunities for, uh, you know, uh, obviously bringing wealth to the province, bringing in new dollars and so on to the province, uh, paying taxes, all that stuff. And I totally support all that, and I understand that. And obviously, obviously they need to have uh, a mechanism uh, to get their viewpoint across. Uh, no different than you, you know, municipalities have a voice through the um, uh, through municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, and certainly the business sector would have it through the chambers of commerce and the, and the boards of trade. We understand that, but you know, the bottom line is is that um, uh, and, and so there's obviously a place uh, for that because they are they are obviously important stakeholders. So I'm not suggesting that uh, the business community should not have a say. They absolutely should have a say. But I guess where I'm uh, coming from here is that where you have parties, especially the, the two mainstream parties in particular, that are relying so heavily uh, on these corporate donations and so on, and then when you hear about, you know, all of these, all the money that gets spent on these consultants' reports and all these, you know, contracts that get let, and then you hear discrepancies that occur, like, you know, when, when the Auditor General talks about the Public Tendering Act, and and then, uh, you know, uh, all these consultants can be hired. They don't even have to go through the Public Tendering Act because it's considered a professional service, I believe. Um, you know, and, um, and, and so, you know, when you look at some of these things and um, you know, um, some of the controversy around some of the projects that have happened here, like you look at Muskrat Falls and, I mean, like, like Muskrat Falls is the one that comes to mind when, or, or Nalcor, when the uh, outgoing uh, chair of the board, uh, Mr. Marshall, uh, not Stan Marshall, would be uh, Ken Marshall, um, made the allegation, and was there publicly, he made allegations of conflict of interest by the, I think it was the finance minister at the time when she was the chair. Right? He came out and said that that was in the news story, uh, that there was conflicts of interest. Well, it was interesting that those allegations were made, uh, but he was dating back to two or three or three or four years ago, saying, yeah. oh, she was in the conflict back then. Yeah, well, under, the will know, under the Williams government or under Dunderdale's yes, government. Yes. Correct. Correct. So, so I have to ask the question, if he knew that she was in a conflict four years ago, why didn't you raise it four years ago? Why, why try to dig up the dirt and raise the allegations now, four years later? Because you've fallen out of favor. So it was okay when we were okay. Now that you've taken me on, it's not okay. So then you have to ask the question, well, who else might be in a conflict of interest who hasn't fallen out of favor? You know what I'm saying? Well, I think, Paul, and if I could, if I could just sort of lead lead on here, that there is a, a yep. revolve a, something of a revolving door between it seems like the top levels in our government yes. and mm -hmm. the top levels in our business, and maybe you could speak to that if if you could for a moment. And let me actually give you a, a line from um, a gentleman, and I, and I may I, I think I'm just going to lead attacking a politician's business interests for tough decision seems a good way to reduce the future pool of good candidates, which I interpret to mean him basically saying, why would I want to run for politics? Why would I go through the revolving door if when I get to the other side, people are going to attack my private interests now that I'm a public person? Uh -huh. Yeah, and you know what? I do not, I, I, I want to say this, like I don't, condone, I think that we have to try um, you know, that's just my personal view, to separate uh, someone's private life and private um, business and whatever they're in, you have to separate that from the public office. And I agree with him uh, on that. So long as there's no conflicts that exist, um, you know, but at the, same, at, at, at the same time, and I understand, you know, and, and we also have this concept somehow that, and we've seen it, that we need to keep electing these saviors, these so-called business leaders and all these people that somehow they're the only ones who can run the province. They're the best people to run the province because they have a successful business or whatever. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and, and, and that's not saying that they can't run, uh, but at the end of the day, what we need are 
people with good common sense, people who can listen to the public, and people who have a clear understanding of the day-to-day -day life and the issues facing the citizens. Uh, that's what we need. And that may or may not come in the form of, uh, of, of, of a business person or business leader. But for some reason, we've convinced ourselves that the only people uh, capable and qualified to run our government is somebody who's some big business exec or whatever, and they're the only ones who are capable of doing it. And mm -hmm. I think history has shown us that that's not necessarily the case. Now, uh, let, let me just uh, put this here as, a, as some, more of a provocation than anything, because I think you're contradicting yourself a little bit. At okay. earlier, earlier you say that yep. we've got this group of people that we might, we might as well call the, the cocktail circuit, and that they are kind of the ones who are going to empower our, our political class or our political leaders. So in order to become a political leader in, in this province, you kind of have to get the nod from the cocktail circuit, don't you? And who is, who is it that they're going to give the nod to? So do we have this democracy in which we can elect who we want, or are we just given the, the, the choices, you know, blue or red, uh, here's the guy who's running the party, uh, do, are we actually getting any real choices? Well, that's that's the uh, that's part of the problem, and that's why we need reform. That's why I'm suggesting that um, that, like, from a reform point of view, there should be serious cuts. Uh, I mean, very significant cuts, as far as I'm concerned, to the amount of party, uh, the amount of money that any party can raise during an election process, the amount of money that any party can spend during an election process, the amount of money that any candidate can rate, like right now it is limited. You can only, like for example, I could have spent $40,000, I think it was, in the last provincial election, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that should be 10,000. I'm saying 10,000, I'm throwing that out as a number. Maybe it should be 15, maybe it should be five, I don't know. But like it should be much less than uh, 40. Um, um, the amount of money that I could raise, the amount of money that I could spend, and the amount of money, and I shouldn't be able to get that full 10 or 15 from one person uh, writing a check on her. Um, this is why I talk about reform, so that you can have more people uh, and you can have putting people on a more level playing field. Um, you know, the, the Liberal Party or the PC Party should not be able to go and spend a million dollars, if that's what the number is, uh, you know, with this big bus going around the province and all the, you know, like big money. Like, let's, let's get, a, let's, let's do away with that. Let's, let's, Take uh, election signs, for example, which a lot of people would argue are uh, only uh, uh, bad for the environment anyway. Um, let's eliminate election signs on public property altogether. If someone wants to put it on their private property, on their lawn or something, they can fill their boots. But as far as saying that we're going to put them up on the roadways, let's get rid of it altogether, or at least let's limit it. Let's yeah. limit uh, all these things. You know, let's. Why not have? Why not have, uh, through elections, Newfoundland and Labrador, someone has suggested to me, if somebody wants to run, why not have elections, Newfoundland and Labrador create a web page and give every candidate a certain amount of space, so many pages on it, to put out their platform, their, you know, their information about them, why you should vote for them, and make it an equal playing field for mm -hmm. people. If you did all of these things and you eliminated the amount of money that's required, then you wouldn't need unions and you wouldn't need big corporations to fund these campaigns and you would put it on a more level playing field so that the average person who has something to offer that doesn't have the connections, they have the ability to run and be successful. Yeah. Now, I mean, all the things that you're saying here, like all party committees, limiting co uh, donations, corporate union donations, all these kind of things, I mean, the, these are all pretty reasonable things, right? Like, yes. to me, none of these sound like they're radical or revolutionary ideas you know you're not no. asking you're not asking for like a uh, direct democracy or a consensus government and you're not asking for you know uh, a, a radically different form of government at all you're you, it sounds like you're saying asking for some pretty simple stuff and, and what do you think is the likelihood that any of this is just gonna come about because uh, people will be persuaded um, I am I suppose you never say never, but based on my experience, what I've seen, whatever, I don't see it. Personally, I don't see it happening. Mm 
Now, that's my opinion. I don't see it happening. Um, quite frankly, you'll hear opposition parties in particular will cry foul about all these, you know, some of these things when they're in opposition. And once they form government, it all changes because now they have the power. You know, like it's interesting that, you know, the uh, the Liberal Party and so on were, were talking about we should have more uh, NDP more so, but even the Liberals as well, talking about all party committees and talking about, you know, all these things that were happening in the House. Uh, and when they form government, the response you got is, well, you were no better when you were there. You didn't do it for us, so Shag, you were not going to do it for you. So, you know, because now we're in power. Now it's our turn to be in charge, you see? It all comes down to now it's our turn, right? So um, I don't see it happening um, unless there is a major uh, movement, uh, a public movement, whether that should come in the form of some kind of a uh, public campaign outside of the party system or whether it should come uh, by way of a new party coming on the scene that would, that would be their platform, for example. Uh, to make these changes and to force that issue and make it an issue, unless something like that happens, I don't see the other parties that we have in place uh, just doing it or, or pushing for it. I don't see it. Now, you might hear some of them say, yeah, that sounds like some good ideas. But again, if they got in power tomorrow, uh, you know, I don't see that. But I think for the next election campaign, uh, I think it needs to be a major issue in the next election campaign. Um, somebody has to make it a major issue. Well, that, and that was going to be my next question: is what what would need to happen? So again, and I, I keep I keep going back to this this lovely line about the about the cocktail circuit. What do you think? Uh, the or or here's here's how the question is: Do you feel that you're you're going to take heat from making comments like this or from speaking so uh, plainly? To people like me and, and in interviews and things like this, uh, do you think the main parties and the the cocktail circuit that backs them uh, is going to try and marginalize you? I don't care. Simple. <laughs> I really don't care. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, um, sure, you're I'm, 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 <laughs> that's it. No, that, that, I mean, look. Um, I, listen, I was liberated, uh, if you want to call it liberated, okay? Let me put it this in context, okay? I was liberated, or I liberated myself, uh, I, I guess I'll say, um, what, three years ago, when I left the PC party on my own accord. Um, I was, after two years of uh, playing the game, okay? Because that's what you're doing two years of playing the game and playing it very well from the party's perspective, from the party line, right? I mean, people said, yeah, you were oh, a I did, <laughs> yeah, I took a lot of, I took a lot of flack. Uh, I took a lot of flack because people were associating me as, uh, what did they call me? The, uh, the, the attack dog, Dunderdale's attack dog, the defender of Dunderdale, the defender of this and that and everything else. Bottom line is, is that uh, anything I've ever done, in my life, uh, I've given 110%. There are no half measures uh, with me. Uh, if I decide I'm going to do something or take something on, then um, I'm generally not like the average person. I'm one of these people who uh, some people would say you're over the top. You're, you're uh, you know, um, that's just kind of the way I am when I take something on. So at the time, I guess, uh, playing the game uh, in my role as caucus chair or member of government and being asked, as other members were asked, like to put out the party message to, you know, whatever you, I did it to the best of my ability and I was relentless. And I guess as a result of, of, uh, of that, uh, I kept getting asked by the party, okay, well then, will you do this interview? Will you do that interview? And I gladly accept it, you know what I mean? Because it was my role and I was doing. But once I, once I woke up, I'm gonna call it, to the reality, because you gotta remember, when you get into this first, you're a greenhorn. And uh, you know, you're not familiar with the system, whatever, it's kind of intimidating to some degree. And, and if you're part of that group and, and, uh, and you know, you're being asked 
to do certain things. And if you, you know, if you look at a guy like, you know, a Jerome Kennedy or whatever, and you're saying, Jesus, Jerome is a brilliant guy or whatever. If he's saying this is right, it must be right. And, and whatever. So now they're asking me to be the spokesperson on this or that. You take that as a sort of a compliment as a positive thing. And you do the best you can. And then they say, boy, you did a great job. Can you do this one for us? And you're, you know, you're getting that positive affirmation and you keep on going and you do what you feel you know, the role you've been given and to do it to the best of your ability. But I guess at some point you wake up and you sort of come out of the little bubble because when you're there, you are in a bubble, uh, in, in you know, in government, and you have this whole group think mentality going on. But, uh, you know, once I sort of realized, I guess, what was going on and the decisions that were being made, and the role that I was playing, you know, uh, in it, in terms of promoting the message and so on. And once I really realized all that, and particularly after Derek and L, that was really the sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for me, um, I decided, hold on a second here, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Some of this stuff that, you know, I, I, a lot of this stuff is happening, I, I'm not agreeing with. And uh, Bill 29 was a big one. I brought it up numerous times. It got ignored numerous times. Um, finally, we had a caucus retreat. It was the last time where I was, was supposed to deal with that in a number of issues. Nothing got dealt with. I said, shag this. I've had enough of this. I'm not going to be a puppet anymore. And I liberated myself. Mm -hmm. And I did, pay, uh, I did pay a price politically, I believe, uh, for that. I took a lot of heat, whatever. And, yes, Thankfully, the people did uh, elect me again. Uh, certainly never got the high numbers that I would have liked to have gotten, but nonetheless, I did get another opportunity. But when I, when I made that decision uh, to, uh, to leave the PC party, I, may, I vowed at that point in time, I vowed to myself that I would never, ever, ever again be anybody's puppet. I cut those puppet strings for good, and I said, and I vowed well, I would never go back again. So, of course, the two years I was with the Liberals, you were in opposition. You weren't constrained, uh, per se, in, in opposition. It was just like keep the issues going and whatever. Uh, it was a different dynamic. Uh, but, of course, once we got in and we formed government, then we saw the same thing happen as it happened before. You had that small group in the cabinet. They were calling all the shots. You weren't informed about anything. You weren't included in anything. And then, of course, we saw this horrible budget that I was expected to support. And and uh, I knew from day one I wasn't going to support it. But it was a matter of, you know, um, I can remember when it came, when I saw it. And I remember calling home and saying to my wife, then, I said, like, I'm not supporting this budget. There's not a chance, <laughs> There's not a chance in hell I'm voting for this. Right? But I said, but I have time. I have time because it'll be several weeks before it actually gets voted on. So I have lots of time to keep bringing up the caucus and, and, and have meetings with, you know, internally and try to get it changed. And I did that week after week after week after week after week until it became abundantly clear um, that, don't, well, that day, actually, we had a caucus meeting the day of that vote that, that I voted on that. And they said that at that time, I brought it up again uh, and put it all out there on the table. And um, and they said, don't even bother to bring it up again. It's pointless to keep talking about this week after week. Nothing is changing. So then I said, okay, fine. Nothing is changing. Forget it. Uh, I, I guess, you know, so I knew then uh, that, uh, you know, that's what was going to happen. But, you know. To the point I guess I'm making is that I liberated myself when I left Dunderdale after two years, and uh, really I've been liberated, if you will, ever since. And I said, never again will I be a yes man, and I won't. I, and I guess I, I think one of the most... At the end of the day, I was elected by the people. The only, the only backlash I'm concerned about uh, are from the people who elected me. And by the way, you're right. I mean, this is not uh, this is not uh, about small business. I mean, look, I received plenty of donations, uh, corporate donations, when I ran um, from uh, numerous sources, um, uh, and that was municipally and provincially. Uh, like a lot of local businesses, like you know, a hundred dollars or two hundred bucks or something like that. And that's not what I'm talking about. No. I don't, there's no issue with that. 
But no, no. if you get these big corporations that are going to write the Liberal Party or the PC Party a check for ten thousand dollars, and then they're going to sponsor their oh, golf yeah. tournament every year, and then they're going to buy uh, uh, five thousand dollar tickets to these dinners and stuff like that, then that's the kind of stuff that needs to be stopped, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Well, I I have those lists. Like I, yeah. I have the lists of all the political do- donations from the. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it's construction. And then a lot of these uh, these other firms, you know, like architecture and uh, all these kind of people who are going to be bidding on government contracts, right? Correct. Correct. So, you know, s- small businesses aren't bidding on anything. No, it's not about the small business. That's not that's not the issue. Yeah. What is about the big time uh, businesses and uh, big time corporations and big time, uh, you know, people of influence. You know, but, but that's why I say the cocktail circuit because you got to remember that regardless if there's PCs or liberals or government or whatever, I really believe you sort of have this elite group that are in on everything. They, you mean they own multiple businesses, they own, you know, uh, they have business interests, business interests all over the place, and uh, they're in the know, and they have connections uh, in all parties in everything because they make sure that they have connections on all sides. And, uh, you know, it's not just necessarily about winning a contract as much as uh, even, uh, you know, people could argue, you know, do they do, and I, I'm not saying they do, I don't want to um, accuse anybody of things that I can't prove or know, but, you know, people would ask, do you have the inside scoop uh, of, of things that are going to be happening in the future? Uh, you know, where you can acquire land or property or whatever, knowing in advance that this is going to, that this is planned two years, three years down the road, and all of a sudden it's going to be a huge, uh, you know, huge impact on your on your investment that well, you ever, have, wouldn't know about. You know what I mean? You'd have to say it's a pretty big coincidence that the same families have been snapping up all the same stuff for generations. Correct. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, and would would you right. say, I mean, like, it's... it's I don't know. I mean, I haven't been privy to any of these conversations, you know what I'm saying? I haven't been privy to any of this. But you're right. It is, like, you, you know, it, it is... It seems like all of the the major, you know, things that are happening always seem to come back to the same players, doesn't it? Yeah. And for them, for the cocktail circuit... Uh, the system's working just fine the way it is. Why would they want to change anything? They wouldn't. They wouldn't. Red, blue, whatever. Yeah, they wouldn't. But you need to make what needs to happen, as far as I'm concerned, is that those players need to be made um, not irrelevant, because uh, irrelevant is not the right word, but from a political point of view, then they don't need that then we need a system where uh they have no more influence than you or I as individuals. Anything else you wanted to say on the record? No by there's uh you know nothing more I can say other than uh you know I I I was elected by the people of Mount Pearl Southlands and that's who I represent and it'll be their interest that I'll be bringing forward. Uh, it's the issues of the common person, and we, obviously there has to be, there's a role, as I said, uh, for business, both big business and small business. Uh, they have a role. Their interests have to be considered in the scheme of things as well. But at the end of the day, we also have to be concerned for the everyday person that we were elected to represent, uh, whether they be of means or, or, or not. And certainly, we had to protect the most vulnerable, and um, and and that's where it's at for me. And uh, I'm sick and tired. Quite frankly, I played the political game for a couple of years. I did it to the best of my ability. Some people would say I excelled at it. Some people would say they were disgusted by it, depending on who you ask. Uh, but I did play the political game for a couple of years. I cut the puppet strings. I said never again, and it will be never again. And any decisions. Uh, I make or any words that come out of my mouth will be my own words from now on. I will not be listening to any spin doctors. There is no, uh, there is no messaging. I have no communications uh, gurus or spin doctors tell me what to say, nor will I. And uh, and um, I want to keep it real.